Hello friends, I'm Ashish Tabari, founder and CEO of Axomize, and welcome to our new podcast today. To our new listeners, you're very welcome, and to our old ones, welcome back, and thanks for staying in touch. I have a very interesting guest in the house today, and um, I'm going to be having a lot of interesting chat about how uh, this person and his organization can get a bunch of supercomputers on wheels. I'm talking about Khalid Malaj, who's founder and CEO of Visora, a company who's uh, looking at developing solutions and have uh, lots of different profile of products and solutions in the space of autonomous driving. Hello, Khalid. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Ashish. Thank you for having me today. Oh, it's a pleasure, man. And uh, thank you very much for uh, choosing to come and talk to us. Um, and we would... Um, love to talk about what you're trying to do in this space. Hey, Khalid, um, you know, before we talk about all of the interesting technical things that you and your company do, um, what I would like to do is to explore a little bit of your personal history, um, just to see <laughs> how, how did you come about doing science and engineering? Where were you born? What is your personal story? Okay, uh, so where I come from, actually I was born in Tunisia and uh, I came to France when I was uh, 18 years old to finish my studies. Um, it's interesting because this was following an agreement between the two countries to allow some students actually to do their university studies in France. So this is the way it, um, it helped me to, uh, to come to France to finish my study. Um, the, 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 my engineering, actually, the way I came to do engineering is, um, it, it was not really a question to me because when I was at high school, I was already trying to understand how things work, etc. So the, the question didn't really come up. Um, the only, the only thing is, um, the domain in which I wanted really, uh, to, to, to work. And I look to uh, electronics, telecommunication, data science in general, and I have seen that this is being really very fascinating and evolving very fast. So I decided to go down that path. So this is the way, more or less, I came to this kind of uh, activities uh, that we will discuss a little bit today. Uh, I started working as an engineer for a well-known group here in France. Very quickly, we decided later on with a colleague to go and found uh, a business unit for an American company here in France. And then after that, finally, we decided to found our own startup that we, uh, we sold end of, uh, end of 2011. And actually, Visora that we'll be discussing today is my second startup. I see. Oh, so how old is Visora then? Visora was founded in 2015. Okay. Uh, so I, mm -hmm. I see. I see. So very interesting. So you basically migrated from Tunisia to France, and that's where you settled in uh, pursuing your interests in science and engineering. So tell us a little bit about um, why you founded Vizora. What was your so, idea? Yeah, maybe before even getting to that, uh, I can tell you a little bit more about Vizora's story. And sure, the, uh, yeah. The way, the way it happened, because in my previous company, we were developing silicon for digital TV, and uh, we started that company in 2000. And very quickly, in 2006, 2007, the customers and the market demand started going to something that is fully programmable. So we started with uh, a solution that is completely wired, like everyone was doing more or less before. And then in 2006, 2007, we had to support several standards. And the only way to do that was to go to fully programmable solution. Mm -hmm. So we started looking around to the DSP vendors and seeing whether they can offer the processing power that we are looking for at that time. And to our surprise, actually, we finally noticed that our requirement was beyond what the market was offering at that time. And, um, and maybe it was a foolish decision, but we decided to go and develop our own DSP. So what you are actually talking about is programmable DSPs, um, yeah. not the fact that there was no programmability available, because I would say FPGAs have been around for quite a long time, but they are for a different domain. And by the way, did you consider actually looking at the FPGA segment uh, in terms mm -hmm. of 
of the yeah and I think the market uh, the pressure the price pressure from the market uh, was not accepting the PGA at that time so if PGA is fully programmable you can program the logic itself mm -hmm. so you can do more as it's like a hardwired solution but they can program correct and uh, but the price would have been much higher than what the market was uh, was asking for at that time so we had to go with a silicon that is fully programmable I mean, like a CPU more or less mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, but with huge processing power. Okay. So th this is what we did, and probably we did uh, all the beginners' mistakes as usual for this sure. kind of equipment. Sure. Now, now despite that, the product was very successful in the end, and that's why we saw the company end of uh, end of 2011. Now, now what happened with Visora is that in 2014 we have seen that several ingredients were more or less ready to go to the next step. Mm -hmm. and create a new generation of GSPs, mm -hmm. like compilation. Mm -hmm. So the compilation was a very critical point uh, for the design that we did in the previous company in a way that uh, these are huge developments. Mm -hmm. And not for within a small company, and you need to rely on something that many people are using and many people are validating. So this came with the LNVM project, actually, which has been pushed and accelerated a lot by Apple and Google uh, in, uh, in 2012, 13, 14. Sorry, what was it, that? I, I missed it. Uh, it is uh, the uh, LNVM. Correct, correct. Yes, it's LNVM, LNVM. yeah. Sorry, yeah. my pronunciation. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> yes. And, yeah. then, and, then, and then technology as well was mature to go to the next step. Right, right, right. So for this reason, we decided to found Visora and uh, to create the company with uh, with other colleagues coming from the same previous company. Actually. Right. How it come? We 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 set two goals when we started Visora. The first one is how to bring this high processing power, right, to DSP, but with high flexibility, right. Um, and uh, on the other hand, and this is something that we spend probably a lot of effort in Visora, make the solution easy to use and to program. And this is something that is really, really important. So I want to briefly interject to you, Khalid. So you were already working on programmable hardware from your first startup, and you were already going in the direction of building solutions that were leaning on programmable hardware and with the advent of LLVM, um, things were going in the direction you were um, expecting them to. But at Visora, why did you suddenly choose the autonomous driving as your main theme? I mean, the reason I ask is, was it the case that you already had access to an emerging solution landscape that you thought autonomous driving would be a good fit or was autonomous driving the key driver for you to actually set up Visora and bring in the technology. Which way around yeah. was it? <laughs> so, so that's, that, no, that's a very interesting question. And um, the the DSP and the solution that you are develop we are developing is application or algorithm agnostic. Mm -hmm. So you can put any application and put that on on the solution itself. Okay. So how how we we came to the autonomous driving. Actually, this is not the first market that we were targeting at the beginning. We right. started, and I can tell you a little bit more about the story, but we started targeting 5G um, in the beginning. And this is our first customer that we talked to. And what we were more or less uh, mentioning about mainly 5G mm -hmm. and the implementation of 5G. Mm -hmm. um, now, customers, when they started understanding the architecture of our DSP, they pushed us a lot to, to use and to implement AI as well, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So we, we took the technology that we had put in place for mm -hmm. 5G and adapt that very quickly. It was within more or less two quarters and we created another product for AI. Nice. Now, when we, started, when we started promoting AI to the current markets, the first feedback that we got from these guys, they said, oh, guys, by the way, you do AI, you do signal processing like 5G. This is exactly what we are looking for for the autonomous driving. And autonomous driving is really an interesting technology because you need the two words. You need to combine the pure AI solutions with signal processing, more or less. I mean, traditional, I would say, signal processing mm -hmm. to reach the solution with a good performance. Mm -hmm. and with low latency and good reliability. So this is how we came to the autonomous driving. It was not our first target from the beginning, mm -hmm. but the architecture that we have put yeah. in place 
Yeah, that sounds good. So let me let me talk directly about autonomous driving right now. So now that your business is uh, to a high extent focused on autonomous driving, and yes, five G is also one of the hot topics um, that we are all you know hearing about, and we also see them in the product mm-hmm. land, and you've been um, providing solutions for that. Can you explain um, to me and so the general audience about what is actually happening in autonomous driving? You know, we hear all sorts of stories in the press and we know we have some cars where they could be put on autopilot and sometimes they go wrong. Most of the times they don't. So what exactly from a car manufacturer's point of view are the requirements for autonomous driving and how does it then map to the level at which you are providing solutions at system level, hardware or software. Yeah. So when you look to the autonomous driving specification, they define different levels of mm-hmm. autonomy in the car. If it goes up to level five, so mm-hmm. uh, and, and and level four, etc. Now today, if you look to the car that you are buying, you are roughly today at level two, and we will be going to level three in the coming three years. But the big challenge is more or less to go from level three to level four. And this is where really you go from what we call ADAS to something that is completely autonomous. Actually, the car will be capable of driving by itself and at affordable price for the uh, for the buyer at the end. Uh, so this is where Visua is playing today in a way that we bring the, the technology and the processing power to bridge from level three to level four type of cars and of course uh, to, to, to level five. So what changes between these different levels? First, the number of sensors in the car. So right. if you take a solution like level level three, maybe you have, let's say, five, ten sensors in the car. And if you go to level four, probably you're going to go up to 20 sensors to guarantee that the car can look to the different directions, can identify the different objects around, decide which direction to go, etc. Okay. And the interesting thing with autonomous driving is that you have to combine sensors and different type of sensors. So you need to have cameras looking to the different directions. But if it is foggy, for instance, the camera will not will give, not give you an accurate picture and you cannot really drive. So you have to combine that with other sensors like radars, lidars, GPS, etc. Mm-hmm. And this is where autonomous driving is, uh, is a fascinating domain in a way that you have what we call to fuse the data coming from all these sensors. If the camera is not working well, probably you're going to use more of the data coming from the lidar that you're going to combine with the radars and these kind of things and vice versa. And you can also combine information coming from the uh, from the lidar to the camera for instance to to bring the depth for instance for objects in the camera and you do all this and once you 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 fuse more or less the information that you got from these sensors you still have a lot of processing to be done actually to identify the moving object which direction they are going um, are they hidden, for instance, by if an object B is moving, maybe at a certain point in time, it's going to be hidden by object A, but the object B is still there, more or less. So you need to, to maintain and, and uh, the presence and the presence of that object and, and do the analysis. So, so all this requires a huge processing power uh, that uh, the increase between level three and level four in terms of processing power in the car. So how many be... sensors, sorry, Khalid, um, how many sensors would there be typically at level four or level five? Uh, I think we are talking about 20 sensors. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's, there is a big gap going level three from level three to level four mm-hmm. uh, in terms of sensors. And actually the number of sensors is not changing between level four and level five. So the big step for the autonomous driving is really going from level three to level four. So what sensors are we talking about? So I know you mentioned cameras and you mentioned LIDAR and radar. Could you explain what these things mean for somebody who's not familiar with these terminologies? Yeah, so the, the LIDAR is like a laser and it will give you um, a 30, 60 degree view on the different objects. I see. Around around the car hmm. and um, it will give you as well i mean a 3d view more or less right mm-hmm. the, the surrounding environments uh, lidar is accurate is more accurate than radar 
uh, it will work at uh, different wavelengths than the radar. So maybe sometimes the radar will not be functional in certain conditions where the radar will give you uh, that information. They are similar, except the radar will give you less accuracy than the radar. Right. Of course, but mm -hmm. it costs less as well. Right. But you have to combine that uh, to to uh, to really be capable of using all the data and having something that is consistent that you can rely on for the processing and the object tracking in the system. Right, right. So I have another quick question, and I, this is just coming from me, um, uh, who loves cars. So you know these latest German cars that people drive, BMW, Merck, Saudis, and so on. Um, what kind of autonomy would the latest BMW 5 Series or 3 Series or a Merck, a similar class, would have? Where, where are they right now in terms um, of autonomy? Okay, I would say that what you are buying today is probably in level one, level two. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. And uh, what you will be buying in 2023 is going to be more like level three. Mm -hmm. And level four, level five, you're going to start seeing that probably in 2025, 26. Wow, that's not very far. No, that's really not far, but still, there's still a lot of challenges on the computational power in the car. Probably the car will be much more powerful in terms of computation power than the PCs or any other uh, any other stuff. Yes, yeah, so I'm I'm glad you brought that uh, compute power in the in the front. So what I was thinking when you're talking about twenty sensors, and I was thinking twenty sensors uh, that doesn't sound like two hundred or two thousand. Um, why do you need that much compute power to process data from 20 sensors? What is making life more challenging for compute power? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. So he, here, even though you have only 20 sensors, the sensors they are providing you with a lot of information. Take the camera, for instance. The camera will provide you maybe with 8 megapixels mm -hmm. at, uh, with 27 images per second. Right. So, gives you a huge amount of data yes. more or less to process. That's right. And if you have eight of those in the car or four of those in the car, combine that with LADAR. So LADAR is giving you more or less 360 degrees views in with your 3D environment. And it's giving you that at a frequency or maybe of 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds. Right. So there, there is a lot of data here to, to, to process and actually uh, this is a main concern for the car makers because today how they can bring all this data from the sensors to the computational platforms within the car. Mm. In, the, in general, they, 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 they have a question to answer here whether they bring that in a raw data from the sensor now to the computational platform, which will probably be the best in terms of performance on the end. But the bit rate actually that we have from the sensor to the computational platform will be significant mm -hmm. and difficult to handle. So in some cases, they're going to offload some of the processing to reduce that bit rate as well to the computational before they reach the computational platform. Right. And now the, the, the difficulty for the car makers is that they have to have very reliable algorithms. Uh, if uh, a pedestrian is crossing the road, you have to make sure at 100% that you can identify here the person and, and stop the car when it is necessary to do. And in order to do that, you need to have very low latency. Uh, we are talking about uh, 40 milliseconds mm -hmm. processing in the system. And this will leave, so the, the 40 milliseconds is probably what is going to take you to do the, the, the artificial intelligence, the signal processing, to identify that there is a pedestrian person crossing the road. And this will still leave some time for the software as well to decide to break or to change direction or this, um, this kind of thing. So, so and, and when you look to the um, to algorithms people are implementing in the car today, they are very, very advanced algorithms. And uh, we talk about particle filters for those who are familiar with type of Kalman filters and these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And um, honestly, I mean, when I was a student, I didn't, I was not thinking that one day we're gonna do, it, we're gonna implement these kind of things in, in equipment. And now we are seeing this happening in the cars. So, Khalid, what I am thinking about two different 
interesting things and we'll come to the computational platform in a second. So reliability you mentioned is critical for autonomous mm -hmm. driving level four, level five to work. Um, and I'm thinking the problem that you're trying to solve for autonomous driving is much harder than what the avionics would have solved for because they don't have that kind of dynamism in the environment and the changing landscape of pedestrians and all sorts of things coming up in the middle. You know, once you've taken off, you're in the air, the amount of sensing that you would have to do for an airplane, for example, would be much less compared to a car. It's, it's very interesting that you mentioned this. I mean, when you, some of the people, they are drawing curves <laughs> in terms of the complexity of yeah. the system when you compare airplanes to a car. Okay? Yeah. And some people are saying that probably the number of line codes in an airplane is probably in the range of a few millions of line codes. Mm. And in the car, actually, the car becoming the most complex platform, mm. and this is going to reach probably 100 million. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the car definitely is becoming very complicated. And, and the, the, the car makers, they are facing big challenge today in a way that they may have even to build their own operating system. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. The, yeah. The F Facebook, for instance, people they say that the number of line of codes ranges in the, in the it's more or less about forty two million lines of code. Right. That will be one hundred million. Wow. Um, and yeah. the other thing that I was thinking when you were talking about uh, reliability was how much power would you be needing to process all of these computing? I mean, you can bring in powerful <laughs> petaflops computational platforms. And they would be giving you highly reliable results. What what are they going to run on? Yeah, yeah, that's that's another challenge as well. In a way that if you look today, if you go and buy a GPU, for instance, mm. and, and with a beta flop, uh, you're going to probably dissipate uh, thousands of watts more or less in your system. Mm -hmm. And and this is, is critical in the car because the car is an environment where you have to guarantee at least eighty five degrees. 100% functionality without any failure, etc. So the cooling system will be much more complicated than in a PC. <laughs> and, uh, and this is why the challenge for this kind of solution is to bring not only the petaflops, but bring them with very low cost, with very low power. And this is something that is really critical in the, um, in the, in the car market. And this is something that we we spent a lot of effort on it in, in Visora in a way that we are not building solutions uh, for uh, for infrastructures. We are building solutions to be embedded in a system, and we have to consider the power as something that is important and the cost as well. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, in the UK, I'm pretty sure in the EU, we are all going green in a few years' time. There wouldn't be um, that many vehicles running on fossil fuel. So... How many batteries are we going to realistically put in the car? What about overheating of the batteries? You know, what kind of cooling would be needed? So, yeah, all very interesting. But let's talk about your Petaflops computational platform that you recently announced. So, you're certainly using it to solve all of these problems. But tell us a little bit more detail and yeah. the differentiation in the market. Are you the only one to have this kind of thing? N not not really. I think I think if you take a design and you take and I think many companies they can do a, a designs offering one petaflop. Uh, this is not something that is complicated. Again, the GPUs they are capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is more or less when you try to embed the solution and you try to provide that with uh, with a very low cost. And this is when uh, when things starts playing. Now, th there is one key element that people in general don't mention that much about it, you know, that you can provide a solution that offers you one petaflop, mm -hmm. but important is to see what is the usage rate, what is the user, the, the efficiency of that solution. In Correct. a way that, you see, if you have one petaflop and you are only more or less loading your DSP, 10% mm -hmm. of the time because you are facing problems with uh, accessing the data from the memory and this kind of thing, so you are not offering the uh, one petaflop platform are only offer 100 teraflops platform. So this is exactly 
the issue that we uh, we solved in Visura in a way that we solved what we call the bottleneck between the DSP on one side and the memory on the other side. By in the way, way, I just wanted to, uh, just occurred to me to clarify a terminology for some of the people listening. Ah, okay. a, flop, a flop here is not a flip-flop. You're talking about floating point operations per second. And um, I think it's a common terminology, you know, hardware people use, you know, how many flops have you got in your design? So we're talking about floating point operations per second. <laughs> just, just for yeah, people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, carry so, on, Khalid, yeah. So, so this is something that is that is really important is to bring this processing power with very high efficiency mm, and this yeah. is exactly what uh, what we are doing now how how we have achieved that what we do is that we embed in our IP not only the computational units but an internal memory a, tight, a tightly coupled memory in the DSP that offers very high bandwidth in a way and by doing this, we, we can really, uh, actually, this high bandwidth uh, memory is being seen by the DSP as registers. Uh, so for people who are familiar with DSPs and compilers, the first question we can ask is, well, how can the compiler deal with such a huge number of registers and how the compiler can solve this solution? Mm -hmm. and, and yes, this is very difficult solution that in our case, the engineers, we compile the code more or less that is written at a very high level of description. Engineers, they write their algorithm using TensorFlow or MATLAB. And the fact that we see what the engineer is writing as, a, as an algorithm helps a lot solving this issue. And the compiler is capable in this case to make usage of all these registers. Uh, which, which are not registers in terms for people who are familiar with implementation. It's more in embedded memory in the system. What is the difference and uh, why would you do one and not the other? Memory is much more dense mm -hmm. in registers, consumes much less mm -hmm. than, uh, than registers. So if you, uh, you, you cannot, for instance, have a design, let's say, with... Uh, uh, with maybe, uh, I don't know, 20 megawords or megabytes of registers, but you can have that with memory. Right, I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, so this, is, this is the thing that we, we, we have solved in a way that we solve this issue of bottleneck between the computational unit and the external memory. We solve the issue as well of development in a way that the compilation can make usage of this high number of registers of the internal memory and leaving uh, simplifying the life of engineers in a way that they can code that at the MATLAB level or a TensorFlow level. And all this comes as well with, with a low power in a way that the, uh, the compiler is capable of making good usage of the architecture uh, to parallelize a little bit more the algorithms in the system. And by doing that, we increase the efficiency. So what are you saying here is that, you know, I, I, I remember going to a talk in London some years ago. Uh, there was a guy from San Francisco who gave a talk on how he had taken apart a very expensive Tesla for security and vulnerability analysis. And I remember he said it was a full on, you know, GPU uh, cluster and it was um, running Linux uh, and what you're really saying is that you've not taken this approach of going down the path of building compute power through GPUs. You've basically redesigned this architecture through a different way. Am I right? In... No, you are, you are right. You are definitely okay. right. And, and I think most of the people who were playing or trying, experimenting, autonomous driving, they were using a bunch of GPUs in the train with yeah. the car mm -hmm. to as the system, but when it comes to build a real product, this is, is too expensive. I think that people, they are not ready to pay 7K dollars, let's say, just for the autonomous driving in their car. So this solution, we have to reduce the cost, we have to integrate that. And as you mentioned before, we need to reduce the power dissipated in the car because mm. cars are going more and more electric. Yeah. They cannot really take like 10% of the power from from the engine to the uh, to the autonomous driving, so so that's why we need something that uh, reduces the power in the car, reduces the cost, and uh, brings the efficiency and the flexibility, so that engineers they can uh, continue improving as well their algorithms.
system. And this is, I think, as well, something that is important in a way that we need to have something that is fully flexible, fully programmable in the car. We have seen how things have evolved during the last two years. I'm not expecting engineers and algorithm guys to stop actually uh, innovating during the next three years or the next four years. So, so what you decide today as a hardware platform for your car must be fully programmable. And uh, autonomous driving is uh, it's a new era where a lot has been done, but there's still a lot to do. And a lot of innovation will come in that, uh, in that area in the coming years. So I think this is, the, you've hit the nail, right? So it's not just the fact that you've gone down the path of incorporating high reliability, high performance, low power, low latency compute without um, using GPUs and saving power. But what you're saying is you've gone over and above all of this and you're offering programmability as an option. So actually the hardware itself can now be customized. And this is now back right up in your alley because you're coming from programmable hardware in the first place. And this yes. seems to make just the most perfect sense to solve this problem. Um, so I can see why, why you know, you would be so happy doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and again, our, I mean, the, we, we, we didn't start addressing this market more or less in the beginning. We have pushed that direction uh, for the autonomous driving. And, and I think today we, we, we have a solution that offers the signal processing and AI at the same time. And we see that in all the domains today, we see that more or less merging. If you take, for instance, 6G, we are still working, exchanging with some customers on 6G, for instance. Mm, mm. 6G, for instance, is again a combination of AI and signal processing. And our DSP offers uh, this, this, uh, this capability in a way that you can really mix the two of them. When engineers, they write their algorithms in our system, they don't care if it is AI only or it is uh, what they call signal processing, even though people may call it AI as sure, signal sure. processing, but that's a distinguish between the two here. Mm. And, and they don't care which, I mean, there is no differentiation between the two, and the compiler is capable of taking that mm -hmm. and splitting this on the, um, on the DSP directly. And, and this is maybe something as well uh, that we, we offer uh, with, with solution that we tried in Visura to address from the beginning is how to ease the life of engineers to write their algorithms. And during my career, my career actually, I saw many engineers doing algorithms sitting far from the end product mm -hmm. because they rely more or less on some other engineers doing the implementation for them. And in general, the, the easy data a lot to change algorithms because they know that if they change something, this is going to generate a lot of efforts before they see that really implemented. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is exactly what we saw through our system in a way that engineers, people doing algorithms, they just have to write that in MATLAB or TensorFlow and compile it and see how it works really on the, uh, on the end product. Right. And, and our design our solution is acting as a coprocessor to the host processor. So right, right. In way, uh, maybe here is too much technical, but just a few words on this. In a way, when you write your uh, when engineers, they write their algorithms, they don't care which part is going to be executed on the host processor, which part is going to be executed on the DSP. Mm -hmm. Either they write their code the way they want to see it, more or less. Mm -hmm. and in compilation, we separate the code that is going to be executed on the host from the one that will be uploaded to the DSP. And all this is really transparent with the engineers. And so everything has been done to make the life of uh, the algorithms engineered actually easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've got something playing in my mind. So, you know, we do verification and, you know, in Axiomize, we do formal verification and solve all sorts of interesting problems. How on earth are you actually verifying this hardware that yeah. is actually solving the problems that we agree we should be solving? And what is the true cost of development of such devices? 
yeah, this is really important for DSP designs in general to make sure that what you are providing is uh, is uh, is bug, bug free and can support the different scenarios that the customer may use or may put in place using your DSP. So during our development, we are using several platforms, several different models of the DSP, and this is what we offer the customer at the end. So we give them with several development platforms. And uh, we combine more or less different um, views of the DSP to make sure that it works. And at the end, when it comes to uh, the final verification, more or less, on the real hardware, we have mapped uh, our DSP or some of them uh, on FPGAs using the, the Amazon Cloud Platform. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that actually people, when they compile their code, they can either execute and execute that using the simulation platform that we give them, or they can execute that as well using the FPGA platform mm -hmm. to accept it really the simulations. And this gives you much more processing power to stress the system. Of course, we have a bunch of non-regression tests, like everyone, I think, doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, this number can be significant, but also can be accelerated using these FPGA platforms as well. Right. I mean, FPGA-based simulation, I mean, in a way, is not that far from emulation. Um, yes. It, you know, um, I had Laurel on our podcast uh, a few months ago, and we had a very nice um, tutorial on emulation, and <laughs> he gave us a very nice overview of the technology. So basically what I'm hearing is you have simulation environments and simulation test, test benches that you are able to then offload in the cloud. And yeah. then you're, but should, are you not doing that verification? Are your customers then doing it because they're programming the silicon? So they're basically validating the changes. That's why uh, they need to make use of that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, custom, our customers in general, they use the FPGA platform as well to right. accelerate, accelerate their algorithm. And this is fun because right, right. in the beginning when we started introducing the solution, so we gave several simulation platforms with high level models mm. of the so that people, they can accelerate a little bit their simulations. Mm. And we offered them as well the FPGA. And we thought that people at the end will use the FPGA at the end, more or less, of the development flow. And it turned out that they are using this platform from, from the early beginning because it is the same software that you can buy more or less when you execute that on your PC or you execute that on the FPGA. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting to see that finally this um, cloud platform is so easy to use that people are using it from the early beginning of the project. So now and here's, a, here's another dimension, Khaled. Sorry to, to interject. So here's another dimension of this problem. One is you doing the right thing by verifying it properly, then your customer verifies it and you provide the platform to validate the changes. How does ISO 26262 fits into all of this? Because both you and your end customer has to ensure that the liability side of things, you know, the compliance side of things are actually met. So how do you provide a framework to do that? In general, in general, this one, we follow the framework of the customer in a way that since we are not building the silicon itself, we are building the IP. Uh, in general, we follow the framework that the customer Okay, is, uh, that simplifies the for. Exactly. challenges exactly. for you. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is the, uh, the best way to guarantee that things are running in a way that we incorporate his test or his requirements in the validation platforms. And of course, we provide him with our validation platform. Right, right, right. No, it makes sense. Right. Makes yeah. sense. Makes sense. Hey, I was just conscious of time and I was just looking at you and I got completely <laughs> lost in, in listening to this fascinating thing. And I was just wondering if I could um, ask you, you know, you're doing so many fascinating things um, for this autonomous driving, um, all of this new way of looking at it. If our listeners today wanted to take away five tips um, to pursue a career either in DSP-based design or, you know, hardware or software, what would be your recommendation? Where should they start, um, especially if they were complete newbies in the field? Okay, this is not very easy questions, but I would say that... Uh, the um, 
for people willing to go this direction, I think the, the most important thing in DSP is to make something that is easy to use and to program. Um, and this must drive the way people do things. And I saw many people doing great things, uh, great architecture, etc., forgetting the fact that this architecture is going to be used by others and it must be simple and to use and programmable. So this would be my first, my first recommendation. The second point is never limit what we are doing to the situation to that you imagine in a way that customers are generally very innovative. They create configuration situation that you don't think about it. So never, never limit yourself. I mean, just leave it as flexible as you can. I see. And, and do not hesitate to put in place new ideas in the DSP. I think DSP has suffered for a long time from the fact that it was more or less following the same architecture, the same ideas. And, 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 and we saw that uh, now we need to change that. I mean, in a way that I think we have done a lot on the CPU during the last year, not that much on the DSP. And if you look today to the different applications, the bottleneck is not that much the CPU, it's more the DSP processing when it comes to AI, to autonomous driving, to 5G and this kind of thing. So for uh, don't hesitate to point to put new ideas on the DSP. They will not all work, but at least some of those will probably fly. And uh, this is uh, uh, this is uh, this is this is enough in general to to succeed in that area. Now DSP development, and you highlighted that before when it comes to validation, it needs rigor in the development. So this is something that is important. And at the end, I would say, and probably the most important point, one is that you must enjoy what you are what you are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, DSP is uh, is fascinating. Uh, you can imagine uh, several uh, architecture, or the visual architecture is one of those. Maybe someone will bring other ideas, uh, new ideas, and there is uh, there's still the, there's still a lot of things to do on, in the GSP area. That's my view. Wow, that's really fascinating. I remember doing one course in DSP in my undergraduate days, and I haven't done any DSP since. And that summarizes in a lot of ways what you're saying is that the world is so much focused on microprocessors and GPUs and, you know, the, for the right reasons, but uh, <laughs> this <laughs> aspect of DSPs and programmability is certainly, so I need to go back and, and learn myself. And uh, I think I'm going to do that. It <laughs> certainly sounds very, very interesting. Uh, but hey, Khalid, thank you very much for your time uh, today. Thanks. And we will resume some of the other conversations that we couldn't accommodate today. Um, but yeah, hope to, to have you back again as a guest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jesse. Thank you. So friends, I hope you liked today's chat. Do stay in touch with us on our Axiomize YouTube channel and email us at info at And we will be back again. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.